Chris for Sailing Vessel Navigator in the Bahamas. So far in this series, we've moved on to expert level calculations for lines of position involving the sun, the planets, and the stars. In this episode, we'll take a look at another night sky object, which has the added benefit of being out half the year during the day, the moon. But first, a long story to illustrate a short point. Eratosthenes was a Greek mathematician. He lived in the town of Alexandria, and on the summer solstice, he knew that a tower cast a shadow. He measured it at 82 degrees and 30 minutes. Knowing what he knew, he knew that the zenith distance would therefore be 7 degrees and 30 minutes. He also knew that a different point, we'll call it point B, far away, the light on the summer solstice shone down and illuminated the bottom of a well. He'd made the trip and he knew it was 450 stadia, we'll call it miles in this case. He also knew that 7 degrees and 30 minutes represented 1 48th of the circumference of the earth. Therefore, he multiplied 450 by 48 and came up with a figure of 21,600 miles, which is pretty accurate. The only reason he could do this calculation was because he knew that rays of light from the sun struck the earth like they were parallel. However, the light from the moon is not parallel. Because the moon is so close and it's so small, the light from the moon is not parallel. There's parallax error that we need to account for. It's called HP, horizontal parallax. So I'm sure you're saying, cool story, bro, but horizontal parallax isn't the only thing that makes the moon difficult. Declination and GHA are always changing for every body. And the problem with the moon is that the rate of change is so substantial that we need to have additional corrections. For instance, the sun changes its declination by a maximum of about one minute every hour, whereas the moon can change it by about 10 to 15 minutes. So that rate of change in declination applies as well to, to GHA, and we need to account for that. But never fear, the benefits of using the moon far outweigh the drawbacks. For instance, it's, it's available during the day a lot of the time, and it's unmistakable at night. So all we need to do is use our basic sun calculation and correct for three things. Declination change, GHA change, and horizontal parallax. Let's take a look at an example problem. So let's work an example from the U.S. Coast Guard license exam for celestial navigation. It's the most complex example we'll work in this series. Here's the example. You can pause the video if you need time to read. We're looking for the azimuth and intercept of a sight of the moon. So once we correct the chronometer for a 48 second slow error, we note the time of 11 hours, 22 minutes, and 6 seconds. However, we shot this at 0622 zone time, and given our longitude, that means it's 2322 GMT. The trick here is that chronometers work on a 12 hour cycle, not 24. So the actual time is 232206 on 24 February, not 25. Coast Guard's always trying to trick you. So we'll correct for index correction, and then in the back of the book, there's a repeat of the dip tables for the moon. They're identical, but it's placed there for ease of use. Once we have an apparent altitude, we need to get into our apparent altitude correction, which is a little bit more complex, so we'll set up a whole column for this. We'll pull the horizontal parallax from the daily tables for the moon. This is not a correction, it's just an entering argument for a different table. In the back of the book, there's altitude correction tables. There's one correction for the top, and then a second correction for the bottom. Spend some time with the tables and you'll be able to figure it out, no problem. We're also using the upper limb of the moon in this case, so we need to be sure to apply a third correction, which can be found in the description located on the left side of the correction tables. Once we have our main correction for the moon, we've determined our observed altitude of 60 degrees, 0, 0 decimal, 4 minutes. We'll pull the declination figure from the daily pages of the Nautical Almanac, also noting the D correction factor. Then we'll head back to the increments and corrections tables in the back of the book for the appropriate time to correct our declination figure. Similarly, for GHA, we'll pull the GHA and V correction factor from the daily pages. Then we'll account for the minutes and seconds for the site as well as the V correction.
We'll note an assumed latitude of 30 degrees south, and our assumed longitude will pick so that the LHA will come out to be a whole figure. Remember, we're in the eastern hemisphere. Once we've got the latitude, the declination, and the LHA, we can either head into the tables or do the direct calculations. Since the problem asks us to use the assumed position, the numbers should come out the same. So let's do both. Why not? Both solutions yield a computed height of 59 degrees, 56 decimal 2. And an azimuth of 304 decimal 1 degrees true. The last thing to do is compare that to the observed height to determine our intercept. Both solutions are correct. So that's all there is to it. As Robert Heinlein said, the moon is a harsh mistress, but I think it's worth keeping in your navigational tool bag because it is such a visible and useful object. Let's take a look now at a combination of a moon site, a planet site, and a star site. We'll combine what we learned in the past two episodes to enable us to get a three-body fix, which is one of the most accurate things you can do with celestial navigation. The way I like to solve multiple body fix problems is to do all the calculations at the same time. So I'll lay them out in a column and then proceed down the column, applying each correction to each body so that I don't get confused. You'll also notice that the times of each site are different. However, I was on a sailboat going one knot, so it's not going to make a big difference in our case. So the first thing I'll do is I'll apply a combined dip and index correction to each site to obtain the apparent altitude. Then for the moon site, there's a few corrections that I need to make involving horizontal parallax. However, Jupiter and Sirius are easily corrected. The next step is I'll pull out the declination figures for each body, correcting as required. Then I'll do the GHA calculations for each body, again correcting each as required. For the serious correction, I'll add the sidereal hour angle to the GHA of Aries to come up with the total GHA for the star. At this point, I'll assume a latitude, and then I'll calculate the assumed longitude for each body. Then I'll head into the site reduction tables to pull out the figures for each one. Jupiter has what's called a double second difference correction. For now, what we'll do is we'll note the value above and below the D figure in question, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Now I'll just apply the D corrections to each site and correct the azimuth as required. For the double second difference from Jupiter, I'll take the difference between the tabulated figure above and below, and then I'll enter the interpolation table with that figure to pull out another correction. 
So I'll need to apply both the regular D correction and the double second difference correction to Jupiter. Next, I'll just compare the computed and observed values to obtain my intercept. Then I'll head to the plotting sheet, lay in each LOP, and watch the magic happen. The lines of position all correspond to a beautiful three-body fix, which is a great feeling. So in this episode, we've learned how to navigate with lines of position from the moon, and in so doing, we've completed our study of all sky objects, the moon, the planets, the stars, and the sun. I hope you feel confident heading to sea with this knowledge, and I hope you've had fun along the way. One thing we haven't talked about is why celestial navigation. Most books actually start with that topic, but I think it's a good place for us to end. The standard reasons people give are for emergencies, loss of GPS, warfare, such things like that. But honestly, it's quite far-fetched, and I do it for personal satisfaction. I hope you're in the same boat, or if you weren't to begin with, that I've convinced you to do so. But do me one favor, teach this to somebody else if you can. In today's world where somebody's always trying to make a buck by making your life easier, celestial navigation is one thing that you can do for yourself that you can be proud of. Happy navigating.